Hey, welcome to Innovate Africa. I want you to think about something. Imagine waking up in the morning and seeing the air that you breathe. Imagine your wheezing chest and your doctor telling you that as a result of that air, your health is deteriorating. Well, you might be one of the lucky Africans not experiencing this, but if you're in Whitbank in South Africa, you'll know all about it. Coal-powered power stations, fly ash emanating from that, getting into people's chests. It just can't be good. Now, there's a company that has found a solution to this. They're called Samanjalo, and you are joined by Dr. Tlari Mabohwane. Thank you very much for your time. What business are you in as Samanjalo? We are in the green business. We, we're in the ash beneficiation business. Our core business basically is to beneficiate ash, take ash, and convert it into building materials. It is a material that basically is generated in abundance because we are in a town that is basically a mining town, coal mining to be in particular, and surrounded by 12 power stations at least that burn coal ash and produces about 50 million tons of ash every year. So our purpose, more than anything, is to create an environment that is healthier with less carbon emissions, and we use technology to do that. Claddy, what would you say is the biggest issue that you're busy solving for at the moment? Well, the biggest is, is, is mostly health-related. I mean, uh, Woodbank is one of those few towns that actually has a TB hospital uh, in town. Uh, in our township, uh, we have a hospital that is dedicated to TB. So you've got a lot of people that suffer from uh, upper respiratory tract infections, uh, like your tuberculosis and uh, a whole lot of other sinusitis. I mean, this has become a normal thing to a point that if you, if you think about the next person that doesn't have sinusitis, like, where are you from, you know? Because uh, the normal citizens around the community have those uh, medical conditions. It's, it's one of those few towns in South Africa, I mean, uh, where you can actually see the air you breathe, literally. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's where we are actually trying to play in. Now, many people will not know you as a dentist. After all, why would a dentist start a business like this? <laughs> Let's talk about your journey and the journey of your co-founders leading to the formation of Samanjalo. Well, uh, Kenneth and I are like childhood friends. I mean, uh, we, we, we literally grew up together. Um, so he, he came to me once. He used to run a brick manufacturing plant, which... Uh, when he decided now he wanted to use ash, you know, which I didn't understand well at the time, to be honest. And he, he wrote me on board and he said, look, uh, I want us to do this together because uh, his previous partners had disappointed him and um, he thought possibly he would do with uh, partners that would be more involved. And we started this, I think there was about 13 or so of us. And uh, amongst uh, the 13 people, his wife, uh, Prudence, was part of it. and. Uh, I can tell you today there's actually now three of us, but unfortunately Kenneth is now late. It was, it was a very long journey and um, the, 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 the start was driven by finding ash, purposing it, you know. But uh, Kenneth was actually the visionary behind it. And I always say our story, uh, now that he's no more here, it's like the story of Moses in the Bible, you know. Uh, he, he started this journey got the children out of, 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 Israel, of um, Israel out of Egypt, but never got to see the, the Holy Land, you know. But one thing that uh, Prudence and I have promised ourselves, the children and everyone, is that we're going to take them to the Promised Land. I love how you say you're going to take them to the Promised Land, right? But what underpins this? What are the pragmatic technological steps that will help take you there? Okay. I can simply start here. Uh, you know, Samanjalo as a business, as I said earlier on, uh, uh, on my point of departure, is that it's, a, it's an ash beneficiation business. You know, it's a, it's a business that takes ash and converts it into building material using technology. And this is a geopolymer technology. And this technology basically, uh, when mixed with ash, uh, it becomes more of a binder or a cement of some sort, which basically becomes a green cement because it reduces carbon emissions by a good 80%, and it predominantly uses over 80% in its mixture compared to what would go into a normal cement bag, which is about 30%. So by virtue of that, you know, you tend to utilize more materials, which are 
more waste, you know. And over and above that, uh, the type of aggregates that we also use uh, are also from byproducts like uh, ferrochrome, like the slag that comes from there, you know. So we generally in into a full circular economy, you know, where we utilize waste uh, to its maximum uh, potential. Therefore, cutting down on costs in terms of material waste and uh, maximizing on profit and profitability. The, 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 the only thing that is most important right now to make sure that this thing takes off is to make sure that we finalize the pilot project so that we can get the SABS accreditation at a, at a commercial level because at laboratory level that has been done, uh, the AGRIMA accreditation was done by the CSIR. As commercial partners, we have a responsibility now of, of stepping the business up and uh, making sure that it gets to that commercial level and it becomes more profitable. Now, you mentioned that you're working with the CSIR. They bring a specific skill set. As co-founders, what do you bring to the table? Let's talk a little bit about the symbiotic relationship. Well, this is two-way. I mean, like, um, we have uh, the CSIR as the highest institute in the country. I mean, CSIR comes in as a technical partner, you know, they are there and they're going to be giving us uh, continuous support and uh, research and development uh, in that regard, you know, uh, and as commercial partners, we basically being the, the commercial technicalities, you know, that, that make sure that this product becomes a business because CSIR is not, is not a business, it's not, it's a science institute, you understand? So. We, we take what they've created and make sure that we take it out there to the community and make it accessible. Because our model uh, seeks to say we are going to approach any other area that has a, a, a power station or an ash dump, you know, and make sure that we take that and get the people around there and create like a, a franchise kind of model, you know, where we bring the R&D in terms of research, and then uh, we bring in uh, the, the commercial expertise and then we decide that in this particular place, let's say, for instance, if there was a power station which was coal-fired in Cape Town, we would actually say maybe you can generate, maybe make stormwater drainage pipes in this particular plant. And then in another plant, they'll make a different product. In another plant, they make a different product or multiple products depending on how big the access to the ash and the type of ash that is there you know, which would be dictated by the need in that particular area. I mean, there's a lot of infrastructure development that is required in terms of road construction, bridges, dams, you know. The applications are so vast. It's not just about brick manufacturing. Bricks are, for us, an entry point to market, you know, such that we can have a product that we can have tested, we can get SABS approval. But, I mean, the properties of this material are so amazing that it, it can withstand harsh environments, you know, it can withstand um, heat to up to about 400 degrees Celsius, you know, it has less water permeability. So you can use it as a stormwater drainage pipe, for instance, you can line dams, which are toxic dams, to protect the environment, you know, so it's, it's, it's quite an amazing, an amazing cement, you know, which, which, which we just need ash, which is abundantly available. At the stage of your business where you've got a bit of traction, what would you say are your initial wins? What would you point to? Well, uh, at this point in time, you know, because we've been primarily self-funded, uh, I think starting from inception, you know, I think our, 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 our biggest uh, win uh, was, was, was our partnership with the CSIR because they, we we're blessed to have a partner that can bring true technology and science in, into proving uh, this, this solution uh, to be what it is and uh, what we can do with this ash because we, we had an idea but uh, making it a reality was another, you know. But post that uh, was uh, being able to start and commission a plant and as I said from a self-funded perspective it hasn't been easy, but we, we got that off the ground. And uh, uh, beyond that, I think what followed, which was quite a great step for us as well, was actually starting operations, you know, because I can tell you, you can do an Excel, have projections, have a business plan, all looks good. Excel will give you whatever you want to see. But getting 
onto the ground and hitting the ground is is it's a totally different business you know i mean like you get there you learn a whole lot of different things things that you had assumed that ah this i'll outsource give or take like for instance transport we had said logistics we're not a logistic company why should we worry about that we'll give that to somebody who drives a truck but that was on paper but really think about it when it happens it is one of the key and the most important part of your business because if you don't have logistics you can't bring materials on if you don't have logistics taken care of, you can't, take a, you can't take product to client. And then everything you can produce or not be able to produce because you don't have materials. So it was like a eureka kind of moment that, look, we need to make sure that if ever you're going to outsource this, it is somebody reliable. Otherwise, we need to have our own transport. So it's small little things that you get to pick up when you start operating, which I think for us, uh, having started operating, we've learned quite a lot of things. It was good. A, for for teething a, problems that we, we we picked up and uh, and then overcome and uh, I think also building the team you know one thing that we always underestimate um, is the importance of human capital you know machinery you can always switch on a plug and say I'm gonna press so many bricks so many per minute all done but the people behind the machine you need the right team you need and especially in, in, in the brick manufacturing uh, industry, I mean, barriers to entry are so low that it's not like you're dealing with professionals or uh, youngsters that are motivated, that come from university and all that. You come from, you, you deal with kids that come from broken families that have not finished even a metric, uh, that, that don't know what they're doing with their lives. All they want is to have a, f a plate on their table the next morning. You know, and uh, if you give them a hundred bucks or two hundred or whatever you're paying them in the next week or two, they're happy. You understand? And once you get somebody like that to appreciate your dream and your vision, I think you have won. And I think for us, that was one of our biggest wins. And uh, with the team that we started with, uh, we had to lay off a few, of course. And uh, the ones that we still have now, I think I love those boys and I think we're going to go far with them. I can't wait till the day where maybe one of them will be managing a division of Samanjalo and they can tell their story where they started with it. Everybody needs a network. Everybody needs to be surrounded by the right people to take them quite far. In your case of Samanjalo, what is it that you're looking for people-wise, business-wise in this particular network to help you achieve your goals? To be honest with you, I think everyone and anyone who's in the construction industry, because this material uh, and its applications are very broad and the needs are basically based on what the client needs and we can always tailor make it to meet anybody's need and uh, looking at the properties of uh, the, 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 the cement itself and then by virtue of it also being green you know I mean it is a fact that the cement industry contributes about eight percent of uh, carbon emissions to like generally around the globe you know and uh, if we can cut that by 80 uh, by 80 percent we would have basically had a very serious uh, contribution and if you look at all the construction that is going on locally in the african continent and globally and uh, if we can have that shift and have a global shift of uh, moving from common cements uh, that have a lot of uh, carbon emissions to cleaner form of cements you know and of course using aggregates that are more sustainable and uh, basically taken from waste. I think we, we are good to go. I was gobsmacked recently when I found out that it costs around 500,000 rand to build one classroom in a school. One classroom. I mean, all of that thanks to your brick and mortar mafia, right? How do you differentiate from your traditional brick and mortar industry, cost wise or otherwise? Well, I can tell you uh, that as a matter of fact, you know, given the type of materials that we use to manufacture this brick, uh, there is a significant cost saving. Uh, at laboratory level, I think it was estimated to be about 20-25% or so, but at this point in time, because we still need to do a pilot project at an industrial scale, you know, you need to now look at all the cost inputs that uh, you can possibly have that will now affect that a 20% estimation that I was talking about in a negative or positive way, you know, for us to can say ultimately how much of a saving are we going to have? But I can definitely say that definitely there will be 
a cost saving and there will be an environmental save and uh, benefit, I would say, yeah. A bit later on this show, we'll be interviewing a guy called Henny Buertis from a company called Mulade Construction. They use injection mold and formwork, put them together like Lego. They use unskilled labor, right, to be able to put this together. They then pour mortar in your crevices, your openings, and in 24 hours, you've got a home that's standing. And you can reuse that injection molded formwork 50 times. Is this the type of company that you think could help future-proof Samanjalo or could be a great partner for a Samanjalo? A partnership like that would be like a partnership made in heaven. You know, I tell you, um, when you've got something like that, we actually would collaborate with that company like a hand and glove because what they've got as a mold and a, what we bring as a cement, it, it marries like perfectly well because you just pour it in. The ability of, 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 of this geopolymer cement is that it has an ability to cure properly in about 48 hours, you know? So if, if you've poured it and you allow it to set, a person can move it in two days, basically, once the roof is up. That's, that's, that's what I can say. I recently witnessed you deliver your pitch to the Deputy Minister of Trade, Industry and Competition for South Africa, of course, Andrew Whitfield, as well as Deputy President Paul Mashatile. This was in Dublin. They loved it. But the question is, have you received any traction from government whatsoever? Because for me, it's a no-brainer. If I were the head of education, I would demand that solutions like yours be used to build our schools. Uh, I hate to say this, but uh, if, if we did have luck, I don't think we'd be sitting here, you know. <laughs> and uh, I so wish that uh, after, after that trip in Dublin and uh, an engagement with the deputy president, you know, we can actually get to a point where uh, South Africa sees this uh, for what it is intended for, you know, because not only is it just a green business, but it is a business that basically can make a difference in a lot of people's lives. Uh, when we talk, for instance, about just transition, I mean, towns like Whitbank, for God's sake, uh, we are living in an, in, 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 in an environment where we live in a mining town. There's power stations. We're moving to a greener form and clean energy. What happens when we now have power stations that are solar, and uh, there's no more coal mining to those communities. Whitbank is going to be a ghost town. Yeah. It's, it, it's going to literally die. So if ever you've got this hub uh, where there's a lot of ash like this, and you can convert that into a, 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 a place where you can manufacture this type of cement, where you can manufacture this type of bricks and other building materials and, and, and blocks for bridges and all that and be transported all over the continent, you know that you've changed people's lives by virtue of not having a just transition and leaving no one behind and having a proper economy set up there, you know? And by virtue of doing that, again, you can make sure that you give kids access to education so that they can have, like, roofs over their heads. So it was a great interview. I now hand you this little urn. You rub it, and out pops a genie. You've got one wish. The question is, Tladi, what is the one wish that you would like the genie to grant your business? I think right now uh, we have uh, basically gone through the worst and um, what we need is funding. We need, we need capital injection and uh, with that we will be able to uh, jump a lot of hurdles. But clearly first things first, you know, the accreditation things uh, uh, would be able to make sure that we can service the offtakes that we have because we've got we've got offtake agreements uh, with uh, certain businesses uh, which we can't exactly service because of cash flow you know it becomes a problem to 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 make sure that you can supply somebody in bulk uh, because in the industry that we're in i mean like it's like the turnaround is you got to pay salaries now you got to buy materials now you know and then and make sure that you get paid to basically be able to service that. So if you, get, you can be able to stockpile enough such that the stock sits there and everybody that wants it just gets it, you're done. Tladi, once again, thank you very much for your time. And that is what we're talking about when we talk about innovation on Innovate Africa. 
when we talk about innovation that impacts lives. So if you're in the education sector, corporate sector, maybe you're in bricks and mortar and, I don't know, you've got a fit of conscience and you'd like to reach <laughs> Saman Jalo, I can connect you. All you have to do is send me an email. It'll appear at the end of the show. And that really is what Innovate Africa is about. And I'll see you next week.